I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. Last time on the pod, I covered the Gigantomachia, the war between the Gigantes, a race of giants, and the Olympian gods. I also talked about some other giants in Greek mythology, and I told about how all these giants, but especially the Gigantes, were a major threat to the rule of Zeus. Today, I'm going to talk about another threat, probably the biggest threat of them all. In fact, over the last dozen or so episodes, this threat has been lurking in the background. References to this threat have actually slipped into a few episodes on the various Olympians, and that threat has a name, Typhon, or Typhius. Typhon was silently growing stronger, while the gods were distracted with extramarital affairs and arguments amongst themselves he became something that's really going to give the gods a seriously bad time. But let's go into where this threat came from. There are a couple different accounts about Typhon's birth. In one tradition, Gaia, the earth goddess, is the mother of Typhon, and usually Tartarus is mentioned as the father. In Hesiod's Theogony, the birth of Typhon takes place after the defeat of the Titans by the Olympian gods. Gaia, fell in love with Tartarus, and gave birth to the monster of monsters, Typhon. In his library, Apollodorus agrees with Hesiod that Typhon was the son of Gaia and Tartarus, but he says that the birth occurred after the giants were defeated. Although, as I mentioned at the end of last episode, there is some confusion in later sources, including Apollodorus, about the difference between giants, gigantes, titans, and also Typhon himself. The poet Pindar, who lived a couple hundred years after Hesiod, gives a location for the birth of Typhon. He says that Typhon was bred in a cave in Cilicia. This is a region in Turkey that was at the edge of the ancient Greek world. Later sources, like Apollodorus, echo the same idea. So this is the first tradition of Typhon's birth, that his parents were Gaia and Tartarus, and he was raised in a cave in Cilicia. The other tradition of Typhon's birth is very different, and one I personally find the most interesting. It is recorded in the third Homeric hymn, making it roughly at least as old as the version recorded by Pindar. In this version of the Typhon myth, Typhon is born shortly after the birth of Athena from the head of Zeus. As I mentioned in the Hera episode, Hera was angry that Zeus would give birth to a child without her, his wife. So, she gave birth to Hephaestus by herself. But Hephaestus ended up being deformed in the legs, and Hera thoughtlessly abandoned him. But, it turns out, she must have tried to have another child. In this Homeric hymn, Hera was so angry Zeus gave birth to Athena, she told all of the assembled immortals that she would have a son who would be the best of all of them. Then, in a huff, Hera left, and prayed to Gaia, Aranos, and the Titans down below, asking them to grant her a child without Zeus, but who would be as much stronger than Zeus as Zeus was more than his father Kronos. Afterwards, Hera stays away from Zeus for an entire year, and then, at the end of that year, Hera gave birth to something nothing like the gods or like mortal men. It was Typhon, a monstrous creature, cruel and destined to be a plague to mortals everywhere, to work mischief and bad deeds among the various human tribes. In the birth of Hephaestus myth, Hera threw the infant off Mount Olympus after discovering his handicap. With Typhon, Hera maybe had a bit more pity. She put Typhon up for adoption, and took the infant monster and gave him to the Drachina. This is the female serpent who guarded Delphi and that Apollo later killed. So, just a moment ago, I said that when Typhon was born, he was described as being nothing like the gods or mortal men. Well, as it turns out, That is both a great description and a complete understatement. The ancient Greeks imagined Typhon to be quite the monster, but their description of his appearance changed a bit over time. In the earlier periods, in the 600s or 700s BC, Hesiod described Typhon as having mighty arms and tireless feet. A hundred snake heads grew up from his shoulders, each licking with snake tongues. Out of all of these heads, various sounds came out, some of them speech, but sometimes just animal noises like the bellowing of a bull, the roaring of a lion, or the barking of dogs. Sounds bad enough, right? But then there's the fact that Typhon's eyes glittered with fire, 
from each of his glancing eyes, fire flared out. Now, to me, that sounds a lot like Typhon having laser vision. A couple hundred years later, in the 400s BC, we still have the same rough description of Typhon. The poet Pindar and the playwright Aeschylus both say that Typhon had a hundred heads. Aeschylus even points out that Typhon had fire coming from his eyes, and also breathed fire too. So, we still see Typhon's laser vision, plus a really bad case of bad breath to go with it. So there we have it, a fairly consistent description of Typhon in literature over the course of about 300 years. But around that time, something strange started to happen in Greek art. The logo design for the podcast features an image from an ancient Greek vase showing the battle between Zeus and Typhon. And that Typhon does not look like the Typhon I just described. The original vase is from around 540 BC, so between the time of Hesiod and Pindar and also Aeschylus. And there are other vases that also show something similar. On these vases, Typhon is shown with serpent legs below the waist, and a humanoid upper half with a head that could be human and also having wings. So, at least in Greek art, a shift has occurred, where we've gone from a Typhon with snake heads to a Typhon with snake legs. Sure enough, we can actually see this shift happening right before our eyes in another vase. This one comes from the 500s BC, and it shows what looks like a middle stage. On this vase, Typhon has multiple serpents below the waist, but this Typhon also has serpents coming out of his shoulders, possibly referencing the earlier descriptions, like with Hesiod's 100 snake heads. You can check out these images on the podcast Instagram page. So why did the Greeks go to the simpler drawing of Typhon? Well, the reason may actually be fairly simple. Even though Typhon is described in literature as having 100 snake heads, it is a whole lot easier to draw Typhon without 100 snake heads. For what it's worth, though, the shift in art seems to have not altered the Greeks' imagination of Typhon too much. Even in the 100s AD, we get a fairly mixed description in Apollodorus' library. Apollodorus says Typhon was so large his head touched the stars. When he put his arms out, one hand reached to the west and the other to the east. And from the waist up, Typhon looked human. From the waist down, he had great coils of vipers instead of legs, and from his arms extended the hundred snake heads. This Typhon also had wings, like in the vase from 540 BC. This Typhon also had eyes that flashed with fire, his laser vision, and he also breathed fire, so he still hasn't been able to find a tic-tac even 500 or so years later. Other Greek and Roman mythographers from the same period in the 100s AD also mention the hundred snakeheads coming from his shoulders, and how he made all kinds of roars and sounds. And those specifics take us all the way back to Hesiod's earlier description. Last episode, I talked about a shift in how the Greeks depicted the Gigantes in art. In earlier times, they looked more like humans dressed in armor, and in later periods, they gained more serpent-like characteristics often being drawn with snakes for legs. I also talked about how, over time, different sources began to confuse the Gigantes with the Titans, and especially the monster Typhon. We can directly see the shift in Typhon's descriptions in art, going from a monster with snake heads to a monster with snake legs, in the shift of the description with the Gigantes too. I've talked about the different versions of Typhon's birth, and the different versions of what he looks like. But now it's time to get to the main part of Typhon's myths, his battles with Zeus for control of the universe. In the Theogony, Hesiod gives a fairly simple account of the battle between Zeus and Typhon. The battle between them was fierce. Zeus uses his lightning bolts, while Typhon makes use of flames. Hesiod says the fighting causes the ground, sky, and sea to boil. Waves rose and beat against the coastlines. The earth shook, and a portion of it even melted. Deep down below the earth's surface, Hades trembled in the underworld, and the titans trembled in Tartarus. The battle ends when Zeus unleashes his full strength, striking Typhon with lightning and setting fire to all his heads. The monster is defeated, and Zeus imprisons him in Tartarus. But we are told that even in Tartarus, Typhon still has some influence on earth, and it's from him that bitter storm winds originate. The later version, in Apollodorus's library, adds additional details to the battle between Zeus and Typhon. 
Typhon begins throwing red-hot rocks at the heavens and sets out to fight the gods. But when they see this monstrosity approaching, they all shapeshifted into various animals and got the hell out of there. Apollodorus says they fled to Egypt. The only one who remained was Zeus. He hurls lightning at Typhon from a distance. When he gets close enough, Zeus tries to strike him down with an adamant sickle, possibly the same sickle Kronos used to castrate his father Aranos. But that's not clear. Typhon ends up fleeing, and Zeus chases him all the way to Mount Cassium in Syria, where he tries to kill Typhon with his bare hands, apparently forgetting that he has perfectly good access to lightning. And it was a big mistake. Typhon catches Zeus up in the snake coils he has for legs, preventing Zeus from moving. Typhon then takes the adamant sickle from Zeus by force and uses it to cut the sinews, meaning the tendons and ligaments, out of Zeus' hands and feet. Typhon places the sinews in a bag made of bearskin and gives the bag to the Dracaena guarding Delphi. This is the same Dracaena from the Homeric Hymn. Apollodorus describes the Dracaena as being half monster and half girl. After giving the sinews to the Dracaena, Typhon takes Zeus and deposits him in a cave in Cilicia, the same region where Apollodorus and others say that Typhon was born. So what has happened here? Well, Zeus has been defeated in round one. By losing his sinews, Zeus loses his strength and his powers. He remains in the cave as a weakling. But fortunately for Zeus, and for a world now at the mercy of Typhon, it wasn't for long. Apollodorus says that the god Hermes and Aegeopan, this is likely the god Pan, but could be a different god too, are able to steal the sinews from the Dracaena and take them back to Zeus. It's not clear how Hermes was able to steal the sinews, we're just told that he was successful. With his sinews returned to them, Zeus then must have underwent some kind of reconstructive surgery to stitch the tendons and ligaments back into his hands and feet. Zeus's powers returned to him. In other words, he can now use lightning again. Zeus is now ready to face Typhon in round two. So, Zeus gets his chariot, and using his thunderbolts, he chases Typhon again. But this time, they go to Mount Nysa. This is the same Mount Nysa where Dionysus spent his youth. Once at Mount Nysa, the Moray, the Fates, trick Typhon, telling him that if he eats the fruit on Nysa, the grapes of Dionysus, he would gain more strength to fight Zeus but instead, he is only made drunk. The drunk Typhon is chased again, this time to Thrace. Once there, he throws a mountain at Zeus, but Zeus hits it back with a lightning bolt. Typhon then flees again, but is crushed under Mount Etna by Zeus. He remains trapped under the mountain, and it is from him that the lava flows of the volcano come. And with that, Zeus wins round two. Here we have a version that had Typhon ending up in Tartarus, and another later version saying Typhon ended up under Mount Etna in Italy. Since I mentioned Pindar and Aeschylus before when I was talking about Typhon's descriptions, I'll share what they said about the fate of Typhon in the in-between centuries, between Hesiod and Apollodorus. Aeschylus says that Zeus struck Typhon with bolts of lightning so powerful, he was burnt to a crisp and lost all his power. His body was buried under Mount Etna. Pindar says Typhon was also buried under Mount Etna, but he also says Typhon was in Tartarus too. To Pindar, Typhon being underground means the same thing as Typhon being in Tartarus. A couple other sources, though, are different. Homer also mentions Typhon in the Iliad. He says the great monster lies in the land of the Eremoi, but it's not clear where that is. Another poet, Apollonius of Rhodes, who lived in the 200s BC, seems to be familiar with the same version that Apollodorus wrote down 300 years later. He mentions how a wounded and bloody Typhon fled from Mount Nisa. Apollonius says that Typhon was eventually buried in a lake, though, not under a mountain. There was one more version of the myth of the battle between Zeus and Typhon that I wanted to share. This version is found in a poem called the Dionysica by a poet named Nonus. The Dionysica was written at the very end of the Roman Empire, sometime in the 5th century AD. Not much is known about its author Nonus, and he may have actually been an early convert to Christianity. The poem itself is the longest poem from ancient Greece and Rome, with over 20,400 lines of poetry. Nonus was clearly inspired by the older poets like Homer, and he reimagines a lot of the Greek myths. 
The poem itself is focused on the life of the god Dionysus, giving the poem's name the Dionysica. Historically, people didn't actually really pay much attention to this poem, probably because it's so long, but in recent years, scholars have found more appreciation for it. It does contain a few very weird, likely corrupted versions of some Greek stories. And since it was written at the end of ancient times, up till now, I've not referred to it on the pod. But I think its story of Typhon is interesting, and it's also very detailed, so I thought it would be good to talk about it today. The myth involving Typhon is featured near the beginning of the Dionysica. In the poem, Typhon is described as having serpent heads, so it looks like we're getting an echo of that first version of Typhon here. In addition, Nonus describes Typhon as having many arms. It seems his arms were serpents too. Typhon is described as a son of Gaia, and Gaia tells him how Zeus has placed his thunderbolts deep in an underground cave. Knowing they're there, Typhon steals them when Zeus is away, and hides them himself in another cave. With Zeus's great weapons out of the way, Typhon then goes on a rampage across the world. His many serpent heads spit poison in all directions. In the heavens, he fights the various constellations in the sky, and then goes on to fight with Selene, the moon goddess. Afterwards, he continues his rampage on earth and in the sea. He drags Poseidon's chariot from the bottom of the ocean and throws it in the direction of Mount Olympus, eventually smashing it into the chariot Helios uses to pull the sun. Typhon uses a counterfeit of Poseidon's trident to break off a piece of an island, twist it around, and then throw it through the air like a giant sucker or lollipop. Typhon wades his way through the sea, since he's so big. The depths of the oceans are said to come up to his thighs. He pauses every now and again to pick up rocks and cliffs and mountainsides and throw them at whatever he wants to. Seals, dolphins, octopus, and other marine creatures try and hide from him as he passes by. He fills the sea, and the waters rise from his displacement, and even touch Mount Olympus itself. So, here we have a flood, caused by Typhon. In addition to throwing rocks, Typhon is also said to be armed with Zeus's thunderbolts, which is an inconsistent detail, as earlier in the poem Typhon had hid them in a cave. Nevertheless, we're told he uses them in his rampage, but also that Typhon is not as skilled as Zeus in using lightning as a weapon. The lightning bolts, when they're thrown, go off in different, unplanned directions, and Typhon also needs to use 200 of his hands to lift each lightning bolt up, where Zeus would only have needed one hand. So those are the details of Typhon's rampage. But the big question is, where is Zeus in all of this? Typhon apparently stole his lightning bolts, but what was Zeus doing in the meantime? Is he just hiding in a corner somewhere? Well, as the next part of the Dionysica is going to show, the story is more complex than it appears. Zeus asks the god Pan and a human hero named Cadmus for help. For his help, Zeus promises Cadmus marriage to a woman named Harmonia. Cadmus agrees and is dressed in the clothes of a shepherd. Pan provides him with his musical pipes. Cadmus plays music on the Pan pipes, and eventually Typhon hears it. Typhon, not being a complete monster, apparently loves good music. He comes to find whoever is playing the pipes. Cadmus tries to hide, but Typhon sees him and asks why he is afraid. Seems pretty obvious, really. He's a giant with hundreds of serpent heads that spit poison. Who wouldn't be afraid? But Typhon tells Cadmus he wants to have a friendly music contest, and that he will bring the shepherd to heaven as a guest. Put his goats among the stars, put his face in the stars, and give Cadmus Athena or some other goddess, but not Hera, as a wife. And then their conversation turns into something very interesting. Cadmus's mission here is to recover Zeus's lightning from Typhon. But Cadmus does not begin to talk about lightning here. Instead, he starts talking about sinews. Specifically, he says that if he had a lyre strung with sinews, he would use it to sing a great song that celebrates Typhon. So, Typhon goes and gets Zeus's sinews, which up till now haven't even been mentioned in the poem. Typhon gives the sinews to Cadmus as a gift. Cadmus then ignores what he said about a sinew-strung lyre, hides the sinews, and then instead plays a song on his panpipes about how Typhon routed all the immortals and took over the universe. Meanwhile, Zeus himself creeps into the cave where Cadmus hid the sinews. He takes them and is able to arm himself with lightning once again. At this point, Cadmus finishes his song, 
and disappears in a puff of smoke. Typhon now finds out that the Thunderbolts are gone, so here we return to the original conception of the poem, that Typhon has stolen lightning bolts, and have moved away from the idea that Typhon had Zeus's sinews. It's pretty weird and confusing stuff, but it suggests something very important. As I mentioned before, the author of this poem, Nonus, took early myths that he had heard and reimagined them, trying to structure them in a new way so he could fit them into a larger story about Thebes and Dionysus. Do you remember when Typhon stole Zeus's thunderbolts, hid them, and then rampaged, with Zeus nowhere to be seen? Well, the Dionysica implies that Zeus was too busy having sex to notice. But I don't really buy that, because later we have Cadmus ask for Zeus's sinews when he should be asking for lightning bolts. Well, what does that mean? It means that Zeus wasn't actually distracted having sex. It means he couldn't help even if he wanted to, because he was powerless, because he had already lost his sinews. And how did he lose his sinews? Because he probably already lost an earlier battle with Typhon. But Nonus, for some reason, has dropped that round one out of his poem, and then tried to change the story, but kind of went about it in a sloppy way and still left references to the sinews in the poem. Probably because that was the original story. Remember too, in the Apollodorus version, losing his sinews meant Zeus lost his power. Specifically, his power to throw lightning. Losing sinews and losing lightning basically means the same thing. Back to the myth. Cadmus is able to return Zeus his sinews. He regains his powers with lightning. Then, angry about being bamboozled by Cadmus, Typhon goes on another rampage, flinging rocks, spitting poison, eating wild animals, and then finishing it off drinking rivers. The gods and goddesses mourn all the destruction, but Zeus awaits the coming dawn, eager to have a showdown with Typhon. Nike, the goddess of victory, attends Zeus. She gives him a pep talk, describing how bad the universe has got under Typhon. Nike tells Zeus that Hebe has left her cup, the one she uses to give the gods nectar and ambrosia. Ares has thrown down his spear. Hermes has dropped his caduceus staff, and a few of the gods have even abandoned the world. Apollo put away his harp, turned into a swan, and flew away, leaving his arrows behind. Aphrodite, instead of making people fall in love, has gone wandering, and the universe is now cold and sterile. Hephaestus has even left his favorite island of Lemnos, and it's going to be up to Zeus to fix all this. Typhon, still in the middle of his rampage, roars a challenge to Zeus. He makes several threats to Zeus and plans to marry various goddesses off to several giants, or even take them into his own bed. Typhon also says that he will free the Titans trapped in Tartarus. Eris, the goddess of discord, escorts Typhon to the battlefield. Zeus arrives in a thundercloud to fight Typhon. He both rides the thundercloud and wears the thundercloud. But Zeus is also said to ride a chariot pulled by four winged horses. Zeus is escorted by Nike, and Nike lifts her shield in front of him. Zeus is also accompanied by the sons of Ares, Phobos and Deimos, who he arms with thunderbolts. Typhon throws rocks and trees at Zeus, but Zeus uses his lightning to zap them out of the air and burn them to dust. Typhon throws a piece of an island at Zeus, but he hits it back at him like it's a tennis ball. Then, it's Zeus's turn. He fights with lightning, rain, and frozen hail. Eventually, Typhon catches fire. He falls to the ground, defeated. Zeus gloats over his defeated enemy, and then crushes him under the weight of the island of Sicily. Note that Mount Etna is located on Sicily. Finally, after the defeat of Typhon, Gaia weeps, and the gods return to an Olympus ruled once again by Zeus. As it happens, Typhon may have been trapped in Tartarus or buried under Mount Etna or whatever, but he did leave something behind, his own monstrous children. The lover of Typhon was Echidna. Hesiod calls her the maid with glancing eyes. That could either be a cute description, makes you think of a shy young girl with eyes looking down, spending time with a first boyfriend, or it could be more ominous. Glancing eyes could be the very same kind of monster laser vision that Typhon also had. In the same vein, Hesiod adds more to his description, saying that Echidna is a half-snake, great and awful, with speckled, perhaps scaly skin. She lived in a cave by herself. 
Some people think that Echidna is actually another name for the Dracaena, the monstrous serpent at Delphi, who a young Typhon was given to to be raised. Which would mean Typhon's adopted mother is also his lover. So yeah, there's that. Or Echidna could just be another serpent monster. There are in fact several Dracaena-like figures in various Greek myths. If Echidna is the same Dracaena as the one at Delphi, then she eventually got killed by Apollo. If not, we have another version by Apollodorus that says Argus, the hundred-eyed servant of Hera that was killed by Hermes, killed Echidna instead. Typhon and Echidna were the parents of some very monstrous children. Hesiod gives four. The first is Orthus, who was a monstrous, multi-headed dog. He is very rare in Greek art, but when he was drawn, it was usually with two heads and occasionally a snake tail. Orthus serves as the guard dog of another monster named Geryones. Geryones was a giant. He looked like a human, but he either had three heads or, even stranger, three bodies. Orthus was responsible for guarding the cattle of Geryones. The two of them lived on an island far to the west near the edge of the world. Likely with his own mother, Echidna, Orthus became the parent of two more monsters, the Sphinx and the Nemean lion. The second child of Echidna and Typhon was Cerberus. Hesiod describes Cerberus as a monster not to be overcome and that may not be described, who eats raw flesh and is the brazen-voiced hound of Hades, fifty-headed, relentless, and strong. I talked more about Cerberus back in the Hades episode and how a lot of poets seem to ignore Hesiod's advice not to describe him and try to do just that. A number of them give Cerberus a hundred heads. In Greek art, though, Cerberus often appears just like his brother Orthus, as a dog with two heads and a snake tail. The third child of Typhon and Echidna was the Hydra of Lerna. Hesiod says that Hera nourished this monster. The Hydra had multiple heads, which seems to be a common thing these children inherited from their father. Hesiod describes the Hydra as having poisonous breath and poisonous blood. The fourth child was the Chimera, which breathed fire like Typhon. This creature had three heads, at the front, one of a lion, at her back, a serpent, and in her middle, a goat, breathing forth a fearful blast of blazing flame. Later poets and writers would add more offspring. Many of the various monsters of Greek myth, the serpent that guards Hera's golden apples, the eagle that eats Prometheus's liver, the harpies, and many more, to this family of Echidna and Typhon. Basically, it became very common for people to attribute Typhon and Echidna as the parents of any dragon or monster. I started this episode saying that Typhon following the Gigantes I discussed last episode represented the greatest threats to Zeus's rule over the universe. Typhon was probably the greatest threat of all, since a few of his myths even involve him incapacitating Zeus in some way. You could say Typhon is the monster of all monsters, but nevertheless, he was eventually defeated. And with Typhon and Echidna disposed of, Zeus could return to ruling the universe, and hopefully having an easier time of it, with hostile titans, giants, and Typhon now out of the way. But the world was still full of their beastly children. Some, like Cerberus, were used by the gods to do certain things, and in a way were involved in keeping their universe in order. Others, though, the Hydra, the Chimera, and others, gradually became a menace to humans. But the job of dealing with these monsters would not fall to the various Olympians. Instead, the gods are going to work through humans to get these jobs done. It's going to become the responsibility of different Greek heroes to deal with these monsters. And that basically brings us to the finale of my first series of episodes on Greek mythology. Way back in episode 1, I talked about how I wanted to use the Ages of Man myth with its Golden Age, Silver Age, Bronze Age, and Age of Heroes as a rough chronology to share Greek myths. In the first few episodes, I talked about the Greek creation myths, how Gaia and Aranos gave birth to the Titans and other children, and how the youngest Titan Kronos deposed his father Aranos to become king of the universe. I talked about how Kronos was then himself deposed by his own youngest child, Zeus. That brought us to the end of the Golden Age. The Silver Age and Bronze Age were a little muddled together. It's not clear in the myths where one ends and the other begins. But they started when Zeus reorganized the universe, gave responsibilities to other gods, and over several episodes, I talked about those individual gods and their main myths. For my purposes, we can say the Bronze Age ended sometime there, possibly 
with a race of humans exterminating themselves like how Hesiod says, or possibly with the flood myth I mentioned in the Zeus episode, or maybe some time after the Gigantomachia or the fighting with Typhon. However it ended, it wasn't the end of the world, and instead, the Age of Heroes was the dawn of a new era. My next series of episodes focusing on Greek mythology will pick up there, with the beginning of the Age of Heroes, and I will roughly go through a few generations worth of Greek heroes and talk about the monsters they slayed, and of course, their other adventures too. It is now the end of June. I will be taking a break from posting these new episodes for the summer, but will start again with new weekly content in a couple months, in September. So make sure you stay tuned for that, and be sure to subscribe to the pod on your favorite streaming platform. You can also follow the pod on Instagram. The handle is myth.madness. If you've enjoyed these last 22 episodes on Greek mythology, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also send me a review or a comment, or even a question, at mythmadness.com. And of course, as always, thank you for listening.